Yeah, we're, we're going to finish our first block of uh, El Talk by uh, talking uh, to and hearing from uh, Judith Cobbers, who is the Professor of Second Language Acquisition at Lancaster University. And as we uh, discovered when we met recently online, I mean, I went to University Lancaster. It's an amazing place. So let's um, let's introduce her. She should be coming on screen uh, now. And she's a key partner in the award-winning DisTEFL and Comics for Inclusive Language Learning Projects, sponsored by the European Commission. She was the lead educator of the Dyslexia and Foreign Language Teaching Massive Open Online Learning Course offered by FutureLearn, which was incredible. She is the co-author on the book of teaching languages to students with specific learning differences with Anne Margaret Smith and she's publicly published widely on the topic of dyslexia. She is joining us and there she is to talk about new perspectives on inclusive language teaching. So Judith, nice to see you. Welcome to Altoc. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. And it's um, such a pleasure to talk to the LTOC audience and lovely to see you all online today. So as you have seen, the title of my talk is New Perspectives on Inclusive Language Teaching and Building on Research Findings, How We Can Enhance Language Learning for All. Um, let, me spell, uh, let me start by reading you a story about inclusion. And it's a short story with the title, where do mermaids stand? Giants, wizards, and dwarves was the game to play. Organizing a room full of uh, wired up grade schoolers into two teams, explaining the rudiments of the game, achieving consensus on group identity. All this is no mean accomplishment. But we did it with a right goodwill and we were ready to go. The excitement of the chase had reached a critical mass. I yelled out, you have to decide now which you are, a giant, a wizard, or a dwarf. While the groups huddled in frenzied whispered consultation, a tug came at my pants leg. A small child stands there looking up and asks in a small concerned voice, where do mermaids stand? Where do mermaids stand? A long pause, a very long pause. Where do mermaids stand, says I. Yes, you see, I am a mermaid. There are no such things as mermaids. Oh yes, I am one. She didn't relate to being a giant, a wizard or a dwarf. She knew her category, mermaid. She was not about to leave the game and go over and stand against the wall where a loser would stand. She intended to participate wherever mermaids fit into the scheme of things without giving up her dignity or identity. She took it for granted that there was a place for mermaids and that I would just know where. So well, where do mermaids stand? All the mermaids, all those who are different, who do not fit the norm and who do not accept the available boxes and pigeonholes. Answer this question and you can build a school, a nation, or a word on it. What was my answer at the moment? Uh, Judith, sorry to interrupt you. There's something near your mic which is causing a rustling sound. All I right. I, I don't know what you sound I don't know if you're moving a paper as you speak. I just moved the paper. I yeah. hope it's okay. Yeah. Okay. So, All uh, right. Sometimes, for most of the story, it was fine, but sometimes the rustling sound can come in the way, okay? All right, okay. Well, it's just two more sentences. Perfect. So we stood there in hand in hand, reviewing the troops of wizards and giants and dwarves as they rolled by in disarray. It is not true, by the way, that mermaids do not exist. I know at least one personally. I have held her hand. All right, so I hope you got the story, despite the rustling of the paper. Um that there was this little girl who just didn't fit. She didn't want to be a giant, a dwarf. Um, she was a mermaid. And the, and the teacher or the, the adult in the story let her be a mermaid. And I think that really illustrates the key elements of inclusive education. She was not made to stand next to the wall. She could participate as a mermaid. So we, when we think about inclusive education, we need to increase the participation of students in and reduce their exclusion from cultures, curricula, communities of school. And in order to do that, we need to restructure the cultures, the policies and the practices, just as this teacher or adult did in the story in schools, so that they respond to the diversity of students. 
We need to reduce barriers to learning and increasing participation for all students, not just those with impairments or those who have been categorized as special, having special needs. And um, we have to learn from all, the, all our attempts. We might be aiming to reduce barriers, but maybe our efforts are not necessarily successful or there are ways in which we can do better. So we have to learn from these attempts and make sure that uh, we make changes that benefit our students. And finally, just as in the story, we have to view the difference between students as resources to learning rather than problems that need to be um, overcome. So I think these are really key elements of inclusive education that we should bear in mind when we discuss inclusive language teaching. So um, can you think of a situation or a context or a task when a student might feel excluded from an English language class? And you can put it in the um, um, chat um, for me or and for the others. I'll, I'll wait a second to see if you can think of a situation when students are excluded. All right, Zofia says a new student in class was obviously not known by the others. Low level of language, shyness. All right, when the, the, the lesson is boring, special students with special education needs. Right, okay, so you had quite a lot of ideas. Right, uh, you can read uh, some of the ideas of your colleagues that are coming up in the chat. I'll move on. So in this presentation, I'd like to touch upon three areas, and this is how the talk will be structured. Um, I will give you a short overview how you can recognize and understand certain learning difficulties and learning differences in neurodiversity. Then um, I will suggest a few principles that can be used in inclusive language teaching, and they mainly relate to what we call universal design. And then finally, I will give you some specific teaching tips. Right, so recognizing cognitive differences in the classroom. Students might differ cognitively in terms of what we call working memory, how much information they can hold in mind uh, for a short uh, time. And this information can be verbal related to language or it can be visual. And it is very strongly interrelated with our long-term memory because everything that you hear you're trying to learn first passes through your working memory. And in order to store it in long-term memory, you have to be able to keep it in your short-term memory. Students also differ in terms of the attention regulation abilities. Some students are better, some less so at sustaining and focusing attention. Some students can shift attention uh, from one task to the other easily. Some struggle with it. Students can also differ along uh, phonological awareness, that is their ability to manipulate sounds, syllables, stress, tone and rhythm, which is again quite important for language learning because you're using, uh, learning a new sound system. And students can also differ across what we call language analytic skills, how easily they understand different linguistic structures, right? So these are important cognitive differences in the classroom that um, are present um, across human variability uh, all the time. Uh, and they are also helpful uh, for us to understand neurodiversity. Um, neurodiversity is a fairly recent term. And um, in most contexts, it comprises four major um, areas of differences and diversity. The first one is dyslexia and reading comprehension problems, uh, difficulties with reading at the word level, at the text level, dyscalculia, numeracy problems related to mathematics um, and, and calculations, Dyspraxia and dysgraphia, in some countries, they are in a joint. Dyspraxia is um, uh, difficulties with fine and gross motor coordination, so how you coordinate your fingers and so on. And related to this is dysgraphia, difficulties with handwriting, spelling and writing. So these are core uh, aspects of specific learning uh, difficulties or differences. And neurodiversity also encompasses attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. And in some countries also autism spectrum. So there is a quite a wide variety of different types of neurodiversity and they can also overlap. 
right? Now I give you another task to think about which of these do you think has the strongest impact on learning English? And if you could have the, the poll here, that would be great. <coughs> So which uh, of these do you think has the strongest impact? Dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, ADHD, or autism spectrum? And let's see um, the results soon. All right, I can see some findings coming up. Quite a few of you think that dyscalculia is uh, going to have the strongest effect. Oh, sorry, dyslexia is going to have the um, strongest effect. Um, and I kind of tend to agree uh, with that. It, um, dyslexia affects uh, first language skills as well as second language uh, skills as well. Dysgraphia would affect writing skills. Dyscalculia might be challenging when you have to learn, um, for example, mathematics through the medium of English, right? Okay, and quite a few have um, have mentioned autism spectrum and ADHD. Good, thank you. We can move on to the next slide. Okay, good. So as you can see in this slide, um, these neurodiverse um, characteristics can have quite a few um, 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 different impact on um, language learning. Uh, reading, dyslexic students might have difficulties uh, with reading in another language. Um, remembering information through listening might be particularly challenging for students with ADHD, for example, but also students with dyslexia sometimes find it difficult. Writing, again, can cause challenges for dyspraxic students or students with dysgraphia, but again, dyslexic uh, students um, might also face some uh, struggles with um, essays and, and, and composing as well as spelling. Um, ADHD can also um, cause challenges in expressing oneself coherently and accurately in speaking, but sometimes also in writing. And if you interview dyslexic students, for example, they would very often tell you how difficult it was for them to learn new vocabulary. And some of these challenges are also present for autistic um, children and, and language learners or adults, if you are teaching adults, right? Now, um, these were the, the, the impacts on the previous side on language competencies, but we shouldn't neglect uh, the affective side, the emotional side of language learning. And because the, some of these students have difficulties with um, learning, their motivation and self-esteem can decrease, their anxiety might increase as a result. And therefore, they even uh, they experience even more challenges in lang language learning, which then might result in lower investment and effort overall. And it can become like a whole vicious circle where um, the end might be that someone completely disengages for language learning. Obviously, we want to avoid this and we want to break this vicious circle um, and we want to create an inclusive language environment so that this doesn't happen. Right. What can we do to um, avoid this happening? Um, I collected ideas under three headings. Um, you as a teacher can observe how your student learns best and ask what works for them. You can administer learning strategy questionnaires or work uh, have one to one conversations with them about strategies that they find useful. They, you can encourage them to try out various learning strategies and approaches and give you feedback on how they work. You can, um, you not only can, but you should focus on the strengths um, to balance out some of the weaknesses. So you can sit down with the students or you can ask all students as in a language learning activity to draw up some uh, a table or, or a figure with some of their strengths and where they see their weaknesses. And then you can discuss how your strength can be used to overcome some of your weaknesses. And very importantly, you need to increase students' self-confidence and rebuild their self-esteem by, for example, setting smaller goals that are um, uh, clearly achievable within the timeline. You can encourage students to reflect positively on what has gone well, what achievements they have uh, made, 
Phrase is very important, giving a constructive, helpful, and timely phrase, uh, praise as well as, as feedback. Uh, and again, timely feedback and constructive feedback is really uh, essential for these uh, students. Now, hopefully, you have now some awareness of how you can recognize and understand students who are neurodiverse. Now, let's look at some universal design principles of inclusive language teaching. Universal design comes from architect architecture, and um, it, it originally it was um, um, uh, um, invented to make sure that, for example, buildings are accessible for disabled um, uh, individuals. Now, universal design has also been applied to um, language teaching, and it has three main principles. The first one is providing multiple means of representation, multiple means through which you can provide input in the learning process. So you can provide options for perception, how students see things or perceive things, options for language support, and options for comprehension. Now, can you give maybe some examples in the chat for any of these that you think is interesting or relevant for you? So what would be, for example, options for perception? Uh, what would be options for language support? Or what would be options for comprehension? Oh, I can already see something from Mihaela. Audio to support reading text, excellent idea. Drawing songs uh, would be great, uh, for example, for comprehension. Someone can draw what they have seen. Um, write worksheets. Um, that uh, support visual materials, maps, pictures, images. Um, wonderful. Um, okay, I can see you have come up with uh, great ideas. Language support can be maybe using even the student's first language or dictionaries or, or um, um, uh, glossaries, for example. Uh, options for comprehension, not just multiple choice questions, but um, um, information um, gap activities where students fill in a, a chart and so on. Good, acting out stories, wonderful. Lots of great ideas here. Okay, now um, some of the, your ideas already feed into the second uh, principle, which is providing multiple means of action and expression. So, you know, in the previous slide, we considered input, right? So what the students hear when they learn the language, now it comes to how they engage with it, how they produce output. And you can provide options for physical action, for example, as you have said, you know, acting out, drawing, options for exception and communication, show, uh, choosing how you're going to do a task. Are you going to write a blog? Are you going to maybe write a, a short story, right? Um, and then providing options for goal-oriented um, development, um, which is to uh, set up um, paper-based or online learning planners in which you set regular monthly goals and you revise them. So set specific goals like this week, I want to learn 10 new words. Um, by the end of this month, I would like to understand this song by my favorite uh, um, band and so on, right? Okay, the third main principle is providing multiple means of engagement. And I think this is not nothing new here for language teachers. You know, we place so much emphasis on, on, on motivation and engaging students. So this is about providing options for uh, recruiting the interest of students, options for making sure the students um, sustain their effort and persist and options for self-regulation. Let me give you a few examples. For example, giving uh, learners the chance to choose topics for discussion or short presentations would be um, a recruiting interest, so based on their fields of interest. And it can be, for example, quite um, helpful for students who, um, who are autistic and they might have specific fields of interest and you can harness that. In the, in the language process, language learning process. Um, you can use different ways of continuous formative assessment, not just one final test, but giving um, continuous feedback. And then self-regulation, asking students to evaluate their progress and performance regularly, discuss ways of how they are coping and um, what problems they are facing and what prevents them from doing well. Right now, I give you a few more examples for self-regulation, 
Again, very useful for everybody, but particularly those who are neurodiverse. So you can talk a bit about um, uh, how to plan the learning process with the students at the beginning of the term and then regularly. So what needs to be learned, when or by when, and then how, where do you learn best, and then how do you learn best. And this learning strategy review can be the ongoing part of your instructional practice. Regulating attention uh, might support students with ADHD. You, I don't know if you are familiar with the Pomodoro technique. The Pomodoro is the little uh, tomato or apple you have in your kitchen and you set it when you put something in the oven. You can use this and, and there are also online apps for this that you set it. Um, I'm going to focus on learning new vocabulary for 10 minutes, phones, everything away. And then if I have done my 20, uh, 10 minutes, I'll give myself a little reward. Maybe I can look at my phone. I, I get, can get a piece of chocolate, five minute break, and then another 10 minutes and, and so on. And there are apps for this that um, would give you a reward and you can gamify this, right? So this breaks up the, the longer tasks into sh smaller ones and teach students to focus within that short period of time. Um, students who are neurodiverse can sometimes find it challenging to regulate their feelings and motivation. So you can maybe do tasks in which they visualize and reward success. So they imagine themselves talking to someone in English. They imagine themselves getting the desired grade in the exam and so on. And also recognizing that mistakes and failures are part of learning. And we do all mis make mistakes. We fail. Um, I make mistakes while I'm talking. Not all my presentations have turned out to be wonderful, but still it's part of the learning process and, and you, you, you acknowledge it that not everything needs to be perfect all the time. And self-evaluation, being able to assess yourself, um, checking, have I learned all these 10 words really well? Keeping a learning diary, for example. Okay. So these were some of the uh, considerations, how you can uh, support self-regulation. I would also like to talk briefly about how you can design learning tasks that are accessible, that follow the principles of universal design. And the first important um, step here is making sure that instructions are clear, they are concise, you model what needs to be done, you, uh, if possible, you present instructions in multiple modalities. So you don't just say what students need to do, but you have it on your PowerPoint or you light it on your, on your backboard or it's on a handout. You visualize it. If it's a complex task, you can uh, prepare a graph with the instructions. You pay attention to the layout um, using um, fonts that are easier to, to read. Um, readings should be clearly organized into headings and sections because a huge, long, continuous text uh, without headings and sections can be quite discouraging for a dyslexic student, for example. And by breaking it up or maybe handing it in paragraph by paragraph, it is less daunting uh, for students to read. Uh, visual illustrations uh, can be really helpful, however, they can also be destructive. So if the visual illustrations don't carry meaning, think about adding them, particularly for students with ADHD. Their attention might be easily distracted by the visuals. Timing is crucial. So some of these students, neurodiverse students, um, can be slower in completing tasks. So building in additional time, thinking about what other students might do while a slower student is working, perhaps having flexibility, adjusting the time so that everybody can finish um, and there are extra tasks for others. If it's a spoken activity, you give enough preparation time so that students can prepare for what they are going to say. You should think about how you can build in digital tools if you have them available uh, to support students in writing or in carrying out certain tasks. You can also build in support. So if students are working alone, you can go and, and, and support the student who knows it most. Peers can also provide support. They are a great source of, uh, of help and you can set up a peer or body system. 
And when you group students for communicative activities, consider how the student's strength can be balanced with by, by some of the weaknesses. So who would be, for example, a good group leader? Who would be someone who would be great at taking notes? Or who would be good to think out of the box? And you can assign different roles. You can also vary the group size. So for example, autistic um, students might prefer working in smaller groups or even pairs. And make sure the physical arrangements, again, depending on your context, are suitable. So students with ADHD might need more space. They might want to stand up um, time to time. So think about how the physical arrangement of the classroom might support um, effective group activities. Right. Um, and then briefly, um, in terms of testing, these are also useful um, 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 uh, guidelines, the ones that I presented on the previous slide, to take into account when you design tests for your students. Think about the presentation format, how it is printed. Is it easily readable? Um, can the students uh, work with it? Is it not daunting? What kind of response format are you using for your test? Uh, does, do the task require a lot of writing, even though you are, let's say, testing reading or listening? Think about it because students who have dysgraphia or dyslexia will lose a lot of time writing down the response. Can you use maybe multiple choice instead? Timing. Make sure that your test is doable within the given time. And again, I have done quite a lot of research when I have seen that giving um, um, ample time benefits everyone, not just those who are uh, neurodiverse. And think about the test setting as well, how uh, noises can distract the students, uh, whether you can allow them to use, for example, earplugs or noise buffers so that uh, students with ADHD don't get distracted by others turning the paper or, or, uh, or asking a, a question, right? Okay. So, um, and we have talked about universal design and, and inclusion and accessibility. What I have on this slide is an example of an activity for one of our European uh, projects. And what I wanted to show with this task is that it's not uh, only important to pay attention to presentation format, to setting up the activities, but it would be also really useful if uh, diversity and disabilities were represented in the learning resources and tasks so that students can see themselves in those activities and they are they are they 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 are also part of the learning materials so this is a project task that uh, we have designed and here um, the task is i will read it out did you know that walt disney agatha christie and albert einstein were dyslexic Many famous people with dyslexia ended up being really successful. Search the internet for two stories of people with dyslexia and focus on what they have achieved. Design a poster, a PowerPoint presentation, write a song story and tell us about what you have found, right? So you, here you already have an element of universal design, multiple means of expression. Students can choose what they want to do, poster, PowerPoint, song story. What will you need, right? So the, the instructions are very clearly structured. will tell you, yes, we need, need a computer voice recorder and so on. How should you go about it? So there's a description of the procedures. You now with all the phases in bold, search the internet, think about how dyslexia has helped them, make an outline using mind mapping or voice notes. So we build in um, scaffolding of how students can help themselves, again, with giving options. Prepare your story, uh, making again, reiterating what the key elements of the task are, and then share your story with the class, right? So this is an example of setting up an inclusive language learning activity as a project task where disabilities are represented in the material, okay? So we have covered awareness, we have covered universal design, and then the final part is some kind of hands-on teaching um, techniques, right? And what I'm going to present uh, first is um, multimodal and multi-sensory elements. 
This is a uh, part of what is called the multisensory teaching program that is often recommended um, to support students uh, with dyslexia or, um, or with dysgraphia, so overall neurodiverse students. Uh, you will see on this slide that quite a few of these elements overlap with the universal design features, such as conveying information through multiple sensory channels, hearing, seeing, touching, movement, gestures, and so on, right? Um, and we know this is useful because verbal information can be remembered better if it is accompanied by visual elements. Just think about, you know, this presentation, if you didn't see the slides and I was just talking, um, obviously you would probably remember less. And why is this so? Because we have limitations in our auditory working memory. That is how much information we can hold in mind just by listening to it. And again, think about trying to remember the telephone uh, number when somebody says it to you only. Then, um, you know, it's quite difficult to keep all the units of information in mind. And But if you can see the phone number and hear it at the same time, you can remember it better. But it's important not to overburden students' sensory channels, not to have too many sources of information. And it is, for example, not by accident that I don't have other visuals on this slide. I don't have a picture so that not to distract you, right? Because I don't want your attention to be divided. I want you to focus on these two channels. If it's more than two, it can be more difficult to remember things, right? Um, Another element of multisensory um, uh, teaching is um, a bit more explicit explanations and guided discovery activities than, for example, what you would see in the traditional communicative language teaching pedagogies. And why do students need this? At least neurodiverse students definitely do. Uh, it is because they can find it quite challenging to work out rules and regularities from the language input without any guidance, right? So neurodiverse students might find it um, a quite a challenging experience just to learn through immersion itself in a foreign language context, at least. We know, again, from research that some of the explicit learning processes where students get a bit of explanation, a bit of guidance are generally quicker and more effective. This doesn't mean that, you know, we should go back to grammar translation method or, or our classes should go back to these boring grammar explanation classes, but we can use directed attention and guided discovery activities where we set up examples and students almost like detectives work out rules and regularities in the language in spelling, because English spelling is not as irregular, for example, as it would seem. Yet we very rarely teach these regularities. We expect students will work them out. Pronunciation, again, sound letter correspondences in English, they are not as random as you would think, right? Again, a bit more explanation, a bit more guidance does help students. Same a bit grammar, error correction, giving a bit of explanation why something is a mistake or an error. And it goes up to text structure, organizing essays, explaining how paragraphs should be wrote, for example. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't ignore the supportive role of first and home languages in, in, in this uh, guided discovery or explanations. They can all be great for scaffolding second language development, right? Another important aspect, of multisensory teaching is practice and revision. And again, in the field of second language acquisition research, we now know um, very well that practice is important for every language learner because it helps memorization, it helps automatization, right? For the kind of fluency, I'm a second language speaker, I learned English most of my time in the classroom, um, and the automatization that I have allowed, I have with my, um, productive skills, for example, is to do with practice, right? And a lot of the practice that um, should be done should be more productive practice, not necessarily doing lots of uh, grammar exercises. And we can make practice creative and varied. But what is also important is that practice shouldn't be just crammed or blocked in one session. We should distribute it in time because some forgetting can happen between different uh, practice sessions. And this is what we call the desired level of difficulty. We should space practice so that uh, some uh, forgetting occurs 
And then when students re-engage with the material, they can, um, um, it's more effortful to retrieve what they had learned because that leads to more durable learning, right? So practice, creative practice, productive practice is important. And don't practice in one block and then forget about the structure or something. Do it in a, a space fashion, do a bit of practice, let's say Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then lots of other activities and revise and revisit the material, right? So um, overall, these were some of my, my tips. And I hope that in this presentation, you have seen that inclusive education and teaching approaches benefit everyone. So you can see these little mermaids uh, back again on this slide. Um, they help all students to learn additional languages successfully. A lot of the things I have presented um, have been found to be beneficial in, in recent research for everyone, not, the, not just neurodiverse students. You have seen ways in which we can uh, deliver inclusive teaching that increases motivation, engagement, students' self-confidence and self-esteem. It can also enhance social skills, learning another language, can help, for example, autistic children or students uh, to relate better um, to their peers, uh, colleagues in another language as well. Um, inclusive teaching creates a culture of acceptance and understanding in the classroom. So, you know, you can be a mermaid, you don't necessarily have to be a giant or a dwarf. And it also prepares and supports students for life outside school, where um, society is also diverse and you have to uh, learn to appreciate this diversity outside um, the school as well. So um, just to recap uh, from the first slide, uh, what are the key elements of inclusive education? Increasing participation so that nobody is left out. Restructuring cultures and policies and practices of um, the school, if it is possible, or advocating for it. Reducing barriers to learning, learning from these attempts to overcome the barriers, and viewing um, differences as resources to learning. For example, as you have seen in the project task that I have uh, presented. Right. So thank you so much for your attention. We have put some more resources. On this slide, one of them is our recent book, Teaching Languages to Students with Specific Learning Differences. This is the second fully uh, revised edition. If you are interested in the research behind it, then there is the book I have written on the second language learning process for students with specific learning difficulties. And um, we have the um, OUP uh, resources uh, as well. And uh, we have some free teacher training courses on feature learn and on the Engage uh, project website that uh, where the, um, the, um, the sample project came that I showed you. And um, the Oxford University Press also has a free interactive course on uh, inclusive language uh, teaching. And I was part of the Inclusive Practices in Language Teaching uh, white paper um, that we co uh, wrote uh, jointly. So thank you for your attention and time for questions. There are quite a few questions. Uh, just to the audience, if you want the white paper, the position paper that she talked about, you click on the link that's on the screen now. Uh, Judith, if you can click on the button that says Q and A, you should be able to see the questions that are currently there for you. Um, if you need any help, just let me know. All right. Okay. So, Nina, do you have training for inclusive teaching? Yes, uh, we did provide some um, uh, links. Um, so, the OUP has one. We have a, a free one with Future Learn. Um, and um, you can go there. The engage materials are self study. So, hopefully, you will find some of them useful. Could you, Sandra, ask, could you give examples of how to dismiss learning barriers? So, how to you, uh, remove learning barriers? Um, so, for example, thinking about uh, overlong tests um, um, that, you know, you give, I don't know, 15 grammar tasks to solve. Can, can you assess the same thing by 10? Um, can you have um, a quiet corner in your classroom, for example, for autistic students? With a, you know, even if you don't have any resources, just a chair um, and maybe some plants where the students can, can relax. 
Um, can you give a bit more space um, to as a, a child who has ADHD so that they can um, move around? Um, can you um, can you you know give bit, bit a few more breaks to your students? Just to mention a, 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 a few few examples, or um, can you um, things like? When it comes to, for example, identification, sometimes students get their identification documents, let's say when they are 10 years old, but none of these neurodiversity types go away. They will stay with you until you're an adult. So can you change your institutional policy that you don't require a new document every second year that costs money, that is difficult to access the specialists and, and these kinds of things. So there is a lot you can do, some higher policy level changes to very simple things in the, you do in the uh, classroom. Um, any, Linda, any suggestions on how to encourage a student to investigate whether they have dyslexia? Some are being afraid of being labeled and may miss out on additional resources uh, or support. Um, I think, yes, this is really important. I think, first of all, if you have um, an accepting atmosphere where you do talk about disabilities, where, where you value diversity, then I think students will feel a bit more um, confident um, to come forward if they think they, their um, difficulties are beyond of what is of a typical range within a, within a context. And, being labeled it can be difficult to deal with but in some contexts you only get legally you're only entitled to support if you have the official di uh, identification and i think it's there are disadvantages in having the label but i think the advantages far more more outweigh the the disadvantages and because you get support you understand yourself better um, you can explain things better to yourself, why things are happening. So I think overall, it's it's probably a better decision to encourage students, right? Um, okay, Alani, I'm very interested in finding out the best practice activities for inclusive teaching. Could you refer to us a site or something that has a list of proven effective activities, right? Well, um, again, in, in language teaching, I would... It's not easy to say something has proven to be effective across all the different contexts. Um, now I don't think we can ever have full proof for anything working, but I think our engaged materials um, do have activities for children, at least um, aged between eight to 12 um, from lower kind of A1 to lower B1 level. We have a lot of practice activities, they are digital. You can have a look and see if these maybe fit your, your context, Ellen. Uh, all right. Um, right, uh, Elena, I just started to teach in an intercultural uh, school. Are you in favor of using translation apps so each student can understand in their own language? I think um, a, um, a, a strategic use of strategic and beneficial use of of, of um, a translation app can be can be useful, but make sure that students don't over rely on it, and then you withdraw this support um, step by step. Completely banning it, I think, would probably disadvantage students. But, um, but you have to kind of make sure that students don't overuse it, right? Um, Camille, can we teach students with special needs even if we have no formal training? I think that's a great question and my answer is yes. Um, um, I think there is a lot in English language teaching that you can apply for students with spe special needs. And, and I think all you need is a bit of um, self-confidence, some training, uh, seeking out some, some resources and experimentation. Find out what works, what doesn't work, right? Um, all right. Um, uh, let me see. Um, how can a how can a teacher address a classroom made up of students coming from different countries and obviously having different languages? I think yes, it's a it's a, it's a broader question, not so much closely related to the the presentation today. But I think again, 
um, um, provide the, the universal design principles that I, I presented would probably be helpful um, in, in general, because there you can use them the students' home languages and, and, and their varying levels of, of experiences. Right, okay. Um, so uh, online classes, Maria's classroom, thanks a lot, definitely all the information and recommendation. And so online classes uh, with, uh, with mentioned needs. So online classes can be challenging for students with ADHD, for example, because they can find it quite difficult to focus on the screen um, for, for a long time. So maybe include activities like um, in, the, in the middle, like stand up, go on your shelf, uh, look at one of the books, bring it back and describe what you can see on the cover or go walk, uh, walk to the window, look out, tell us what you can see. So, so some of the breaks um, where some of the environment that is outside the, the screen is brought back into it can be helpful. Breaking up your lesson into varying activities. So um, what I have, for example, tried to do, ask questions in the chat, have a poll. Um, you know, you can't have breakout rooms for 3,000 people, but if you have a smaller uh, group, have breakout rooms. Um, make I mean, even in an online class, you can give students uh, a task to draw something and they show it, uh, what they had drawn. Um, and, and so on. Um, I have written a blog. Um, you can find it on my website uh, during COVID, how we can um, support students uh, when, when all the classes were online. Um, uh, Diana asked about support for uh, these graphic students. So these graphic students might be struggling with reading, but they might also be struggling with writing, um, allowing students to use digital tools, so computers uh, for writing, um, giving them more time to write, um, giving them maybe a, a skeleton or an outline of a writing task, um, helping them uh, with, with spelling, allowing them to use spelling aids can be, um, can be quite um, helpful. But in general, um, all the techniques that we have, um, I have shown in this presentation are, are useful for, for students with, with dysgraphia because dysgraphia often overlaps with, with dyslexia as well. Um, Abigail asked about how we can identify students who have special needs. Is it the teachers or the practitioners' task? Um, I think um, you, as a teacher, if you have several years of teaching experience, you might see what is the kind of typical range of, um, of difficulties a, a student might have. And you will see some difficulties that fall outside of that untypical range where you think, I, when you think, I don't understand why this student is making these spelling mistakes still. I don't understand why this student can't learn 10 words from one day to the other. When, when you come up with questions, I don't understand why with a student, then you might think that, yes, this student might be different uh, from the others. And it's not your task, obviously, to, um, to identify or diagnose the student, but you can talk to the student, tell me how much time you spend on, on, on studying at home, because it might turn out that they spend a lot of time studying, um, yet they are not getting the same result as others. Uh, maybe talk to the parents, talk to other teachers, so teachers who teach uh, the, um, the literacy uh, subjects or history-related subjects, for example, where there is a lot of reading, see if the a student is struggling in that subject, um, and then talk to a specialist. So I think it's your, your task um, as a teacher to, to sound the alarm bell if you, if you see that uh, a student might have um, um, special needs, but it's obviously not your task to, to uh, offer um, a, 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 an official diagnosis, okay? Um, all right, dealing with mild neurodivergent students, so this is Jaina's talk, what accommodations can be made that uh, do not look unfair for, for other students? Um, I think the first step here is to look at your assessment and your assessment practices, what you can do that is fair to everybody. And one of the things is time, 
right? Uh, very often, I've seen tests written by practicing teachers. I do a lot of teacher education workshops, and, and, and some of them are on assessment. Teachers bring me their tests, and I think typical students struggle with the length of the test, right? So first of all, think about whether instead of giving additional time, can you make your test a lot shorter so that nobody needs additional time? Um, and, um, and then, you know, if somebody completes the test, you have additional tasks ready or they get bonus points for, for some of the um, uh, um, extra tasks that they do if your, your system allows that. Um, some systems don't allow bonus point in, in tests, I know. Um, so that's one of one of the, the issues. Um, in, in general, making sure that the test is, is ex as accessible as possible because then you need, don't need accommodations. And um, otherwise, you just need to explain to the others that some students are slower, some students need um, a bit more, more support. Um, and this is why they, they need uh, more time or they, they are doing slightly different tasks. And I think if you have a classroom where, where again, diversity is recognized, then, um, then nobody is going to say, well, this is, this is unfair, right? Um, and I think this kind of issue of unfairness comes up if a test is usually too difficult for everybody, right? Um, so that, that would be my suggestion. Um, right. Um, what strategies, so Aisha, what strategies can be used to ensure that multimodal methods supports both dyslexic students and their non-dyslexic students effectively? So Aisha, I think um, uh, all um, multimodal methods generally support both students if you set them up appropriately. What is important with multimodal methods is that the information that is coming from the two channels is complementary, supplements each other, right? And it doesn't require that students kind of divide their attention. Right. So if if I had slides and the text was in order one, two, three, but when I was talking, I would not go through the slides in the order as the information is presented. That would be confusing. Right. Um, if I had been talking and there was the text and there was pictures, then that would be too much. Right. Um, also, for example, when you think about subtitling or um, or, or closed captions, um, think about whether you know having the the video and the closed captions usually works relatively well because the students hear something, they see the visual illustrations, and they see the the language in the same in in the the way they hear it. But if you have subtitles in the student's first language, that can be, for example, distracting. So that's that's maybe what you need to pay attention to with multimodality. But multimodality in general is quite useful, right? Um, uh, I'm just scrolling through some of these. Um, that uh okay Merdat has a really good question um like what aspects of inclusive teaching have remained untouched from the perspective of research and requires further experiments and and research well uh, Merdad, uh there is unfortunately very little research on at least inclusive language teaching for students uh, with um, neurodiverse uh, students that I'm kind of familiar with, and, and that's the field I'm um, I'm working in. There is some smaller scale research on the effectiveness of multisensory methods. So um, we know that they work, but again, um, more research would be required on that. Uh, we have research, for example, on the effectiveness of, of practice in general, but we don't know what kind of practice activities support neurodiverse students best, for example. Um, we, um, we, we have done some research on how um, a teacher education and inclusive practices um, influences teachers' attitudes to inclusion, 
Um, but we, for example, know very little what happens when, teach, when teachers take courses on, um, on inclusive language teaching and how do they then implement that um, in their teaching and what effect that has on students. Um, in terms of disabilities in more general, um, I've just supervised a, a, a dissertation on, on supporting uh, visually impaired students in reading exams. There is very little, for example, how you can support students who are visually impaired or, or deaf language learners, um, um, how we can help them. So there is, there is a lot of research. Um, so if we have teachers, uh, or, or people in, teach, uh, in, in research fields, they can uh, find a lot of topics, um, right. Um, Time for one more, I reckon, Judith. Okay, uh, I'm just trying to... All right, uh, Wilma has a question. What is the best way to address comprehension skills to students who demonstrate comprehension deficits? Right, so here again, multimodality, presenting the information in a multimodal format, breaking down, the information into smaller chunks, um, scaffolding comprehension, maybe activating background knowledge before they read, um, having questions to be answered after each section, giving visual organizers like a, a template of the key information and students uh, fill it in. There are also group activities, group reading activities where students work together, read the text, predict what's going to happen, discuss their predictions, read in the next part of the text, discuss how their predictions have worked out. We can provide reading strategy training to these students, and we can also uh, support them through listening comprehension, um, asking them, you know, giving more complex texts for listening, asking them to predict, to infer meaning, um, and, and support their comprehension while they are listening, right? I think that was the last one, right? Ah, uh, yes, you did a very admirable job of getting through all those questions there. Jenna. <laughs> they were, they, I, and I, I do appreciate that that was only scraping the surface. Some of the questions that were in there, but Judy was trying to pick questions that answered uh, most people's questions. Hopefully, they, that that uh, took place. Ah, right. Thank you so much uh, for that. Do you have any final words, Judy, or shall we uh, let you go? Well, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for the great questions, and I hope you have found the presentation useful.